that's super. Well, perhaps we'll just make a start then. Um, so, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming along. Sorry we can't meet you uh, in the flesh, as it were. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the right terminology. Um, but really lovely that you're joining us and really great, I think, that we're making this attempt to get online and continue our contact with our community. And that's one of the things that this, this network aims to do. We want to promote professional development alongside best practice in ELC for the profession. We want to make new links with policymakers, practitioners and the public. Um, some people will know I'm reading through the aims. We want to expand research informed practice and international partnerships and involve both current students and graduates working in the early education field. And our final one is we like to promote and critique practitioner research. So anybody out there who's researching in practice, please do let us know. We're a very active group. We've got a research bulletin coming out in November with articles from our members and we're promoting early years strongly within CIRA as a whole, which is uh, an enormous contribution so that we have a place in, in the discussions that go on uh, in regard to school education and early childhood. So enough about what CIRA is, so you, because you can look that up online. You can find us on the Scottish Educational Research Association site as a network space. And we have a number of events planned. This one, um, what's called a CIRA Connects, sometime between February and April. Uh, I've just heard that those dates are available to us. And we have an event in June, which most likely will be an online conference um, or seminar, uh, taking a little bit more time than this one. And it re will replace our scholars lunch. So you'll be expected to bring your sandwiches along that time. So thank you, Lorna and um, El Elizabeth for waiting for me to say a little bit about CIRA before we start. Absolutely delighted to have two speakers tonight. Thank you to Elizabeth, Elizabeth Black for coordinating the, coordinating the invitations for this and to Shaddai particularly for all the hard work he does on um, the IT and coordinating us and um, doing the, the social media for us, which is fantastic. So our two speakers tonight are on creativity and digital play. Dr. Lorna Arnott from the University of Strathclyde is going to talk about getting creative with digital toys in early childhood pedagogy. Uh, Lorna, has also, uh, Lorna has also said to us, just in case, um, we need perhaps to expect some little people at her end of the presentation. And we've said absolutely categorically that is not a problem, we're an early childhood community but they may be very busy doing something else. And uh, our second speaker will be Elizabeth Cole, who is looking at uh, making digital innovation connections through no tech and low tech play. And that is part of her PhD studies. So a huge welcome to both of you and uh, time for me to be quiet and let um, uh, Lorna start. But do remember you can put in chat any queries you might have. And we'd be very grateful if you keep mute until you have a question to ask. And Elizabeth will bring you in on that um, and try and select from uh, the people who are saying, hey, I've got a question, I want to ask something. So Lorna, big welcome and looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, Ellen Wendy. I'm delighted to, to be able to uh, at least chat with, with you, if not see everyone. Um, so, I have said already that um, I can talk for Britain, so I will try my best to keep this uh, relatively um, short. Um, I am going to draw on an eclectic mix of uh, work that I've done. Um, most of what I'm going to present is already in publication. So if you were interested in finding out more, there, there are links at the bottom to show you where you can find out more information. Um, I don't have enough time to go through each thing in depth, so it's going to be a bit of a whistle-stop tour, um, but please feel free afterwards if you've got any questions, um, 
you know, feel free to ask them or contact me um, and we can chat about it at another time as well. So I'm going to look today at um, a range of work that I do um, and my work fits into sort of two, two camps, I suppose. I'm early childhood through and through. That's all the work that I do is um, under eights mostly in nursery um, or younger as well. I've got little bits about primary, but, but in most cases it's about nursery. Um, and I have the kind of digital focus, um, which I'm interested in. And that stems from, these are some of the main projects I've worked on. So the first one about technology and social play was my PhD study. Then we did uh, the last sort of three, four years-ish, we've run a, a study with international partners looking at the ecological exploration of Internet of Toys. And I'll tell you a little bit, bit more about what that means um, in everyday life. And the work has now transitioned and we're moving on to think about multimodal life worlds. So I'll, sp I'll explain what these concepts mean in terms of my research. You might have a different perspective about what they mean, but um, I'll give you an insight into my view on these things. I then couple that with a sort of more pedagogy focused um, uh, arm to my research and I'm interested predominantly in children's experiences, children's play. Um, so often people say, oh, you look at technology, you look at digital and you'll know all about, um, you know, Facebook uh, sharing thing and risks of online resources and, and, and social media. And actually, I don't have that kind of knowledge. I know bits and pieces about it from, from the field generally, but my research focuses on children's experiences and children's play. Um, and most of the time with um, children under six in, in nursery, that revolves around um, tablets or particular technological toys. Um, so I don't have the, the kind of risk um, narrative so much in my research. It's more about how do children experience these resources for play. Um, and so I bring that into um, a discussion of pedagogic cultures, which I'll explain a bit about later as well. Um, but that focuses around how we shape and how we frame children's experiences um, and how that links to creative play. Um, and I'm really interested in playful, innovative um, and creative methods, both in research and in practice. So this presentation is kind of taking bits and pieces from all of those um, areas of interest and kind of mushing them together into one to say how I think um, technology and creativity come together. So um, I need to talk a little bit about what I mean by technology, because in most cases, when people think about technology, they think about iPads. Um, and my definition is much broader than that. Um, I look at iPads, of course, if that is um, something that children are using in practice or at homes. Um, but actually, for me, technology is a broad definition. When I was doing my PhD, I remember having long conversations with my supervisor, was Christine Stephen, um, and we talked in, at length about, you know, what is technology? And could you say that a light switch, for example, at one stage was technology? And I think that really shaped my interpretation of what we mean. So I don't necessarily look at screen time. I'm not looking at, um, you know, those kind of risk factors. And actually the narrative has moved beyond that. You know, if you look at um, Sonia Livingston's work and Lydia Plowman's work, you can see that it's about quality interactions. It's not about time on screen. Um, so it's much broader. I'm also interested in this concept of sort of non-working technologies as well. It doesn't always have to be live resources that are um, powered. Um, and You'll, you'll see that as my work goes through because I'm really interested in how resources become part of culture, part of children's play cultures. Um, and sometimes that involves non-working resources. You know, many of you, if, if you're in practice, um, might have uh, hair straighteners that the cables have been cut off and, and they're in the home corner, or you might have a mobile phone or a tablet that doesn't work anymore and it's in the home corner. Um, so lots of these different resources that sort of simulate technology in everyday life but aren't necessarily working, I find really interesting. Um, and the more recent work I've been doing has been looking at internet connected resources. So things like um, uh, robotic toys, um, uh, hybrid resources. So you might have a tablet screen with a, um, a tactile resources that then feed in to the virtual world that children are working with. So all of this comes together um, to, to think of a really broad discussion of what we mean by technology. And that's lead me, led me to move on to this focus on multimodality, that technology and digital is kind of quite time sensitive. Um, you know, how do we define digital when digital is already changing constantly? Whereas multimodality lets you think about technology as just another mode 
through which children are learning and, ex and experiencing. So on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see a red um, image. And that was actually an image taken by children from a digital microscope where the microscope um, fed the image straight to an iPad. They could capture it, record the image, send it on to people, talk about it, print it off, whatever they wanted to do. So it creates that new opportunity for a new um, way of exploring. Um, so I've said here, it's just another modality for play, exploration, creativity. And everything I do with technology, I, I see technology as integrated into children's lives, into children's play. It shouldn't be a separate or a distinct resource. Um, so I'll get on to more about that later as well. Um, I should also give a little bit insight into my perspective on creativity. Um, for me, creativity is something quite broad. Uh, it's, not a, it's not output driven. Uh, it's about process. It's about understanding um, different ways of thinking. So all of those concepts of divergent thinking, um, I'm really influenced by Anna Kraft's work on possibility thinking, that idea of what if, you know, what if, um, what would happen if we did this? So I really like this definition. Creativity is a state of mind in which all of our intelligences are working together. It involves seeing, thinking and innovating. Although it is often found in the creative arts, creativity can be demonstrated in any subject at school or in any aspect of life. Creative people question the assumptions they are given. They see the world differently, are happy to experiment, to take risks and to make mistakes. They make unique connections often unseen by others. So that broad understanding of creativity as a way of seeing the world and ethos for engaging with life, um, I think is something that is really important to me. I can see lots of things popping up in the chat. So I'm, I'm forging on and I'm hoping that everyone can hear me okay. But uh, if there's any problems, Ailey Mendy, just jump in and tell me to stop. Um, so I made, mentioned briefly at the beginning this concept of pedagogic cultures. And that ties in with my overarching philosophy that um, you cannot compartmentalize experience. So I work from a sort of ecological perspective where everything is influential on the child's experience on, and on an adult's experience. Um, so you, it might be Bronfenbrenner's um, systems theory or it might be a broader social ecological, ecological perspective where we understand that multiple elements of somebody's life and experience come together to shape um, their understanding and their knowledge development. So this for me was kind of capturing that and it was understanding that when you're thinking about practice, actually the context is, re context is really important. There are different elements to context which actually shape how children's creative play manifests. Um, and actually, even if you put the same sequence of um, context elements together like space or materials or people, over time, the experience will still be different because you develop new perspectives and new ideas and new understandings over time. So it's this continuous cycle that you're feeding into that actually creates continual unique understandings of creative play and creativity can manifest in really different ways, depending upon how all the elements come together um, in that pedagogic culture. And it ties back into this understanding that how we frame children's experiences and how children frame their own experiences becomes central to how their creativity emerges and how um, technologies or multimodal devices and, and resources feed into that creative play. So all of this, I mean, there's an article that you can, you can read more on if you want to hear more about that. So I want to move on now and give you some examples about what this work looks like in practice um, and what, what the research is telling us. And for me, I said at the beginning that culture is really important to me. So I was really interested in how technologies become part of a child's world, child, part of a child's culture. So we've got a new publication out uh, just this year on children using technology and role play. And for me, one of the really interesting things was how children take that um, resource or that device and understand its place in culture as a cultural artifact and how that shapes their understanding and, and their play. We all know the literature that suggests that, you know, role play can be rehearsal for adult life. We know that children enjoy the home corner and experiencing, um, you know, what it might be to be a mum or what it might be to be a chef. Um, and actually, as time is going on and as technologies become more integrated into our lives, then the resources become part of that role play too. 
So I'll read out this observation that we've got um, from this chapter. Ruby's granddad is visiting, but he's had some work still to do on his laptop before the end of the day. He sits in the living room floor and has his laptop on his knee working. Ruby decides that she also has work to do, and she decides to build herself a laptop using a wooden toy till, a non-working computer keyboard, and she also brings in her smartphone, her pretend toy smartphone. She sits on the floor pressing the buttons on the keyboard saying on repeat, I'm working, I just need to write some emails. She must have heard the phone ringing in her imagination as she answers the phone and has a one-sided conversation. Yes, no, I can't do that now, I'm working. Okay, I'll call you later. She puts the phone down and continues typing on her keyboard. After a few minutes, it's time to go out into the car. She quickly takes her constructed lap uh, laptop pieces back to the playroom before she goes. But she announces to the family, I need to take my phone for my babies to watch in the car. She picks up her baby in one arm and her phone in the other and heads to the car. When strapped into the car and the car begins to move, Ruby can be heard talking again on her phone. Yes, we're just leaving now. Okay, I'll see you soon. I have to go. She pretends to hang up her phone and says, it's okay, baby. You can have the phone now, I'm finished. After a few minutes, her sister, who is sitting next to her in the back of the car, takes the pretend smartphone from the baby and answers the phone, also having a one-sided conversation. This time, the sister can be heard saying, yes, yes, we're just coming. Wait, I'm just driving. I need to put you on loudspeaker. She presses the buttons and says, it's okay to talk now. She has a one-sided conversation, despite the fact that she's supposed to be on loudspeaker. And she said, yes, we'll meet you there. Okay, see you soon. And she hangs up. So for me, this was a really interesting um, example of how technology and multimodal devices, one, don't have to be physically working. Um, they can be non-working technologies as well. And, and Joe Bird's done a lot of work on that as well, which is really interesting read. Um, but also how they become part of their everyday lives and they see how these resources are integrated into their life worlds and how that then manifests in their creative play. Um, so I thought that was a really nice and interesting um, reminder that if we're looking at technology, we don't always have to look at how children interact with, with tablets, for example. Um, in another example, um, we have a, a project. This was the Internet Connected Toys project. Um, and it was the process of the project was that we, we um, loaned out different resources to families and to nurseries to see how, how the technologies would be used. Um, and the parents submitted videos to us of their children's play. That's another conversation, but it's quite an interesting methodology. Um, and we were really excited when we got this video of, of this girl. Um, and I'll read it out and explain a little bit about it. So Ellie has been exploring Bluebot. So Bluebot is the picture in the background of this slide. Um, most of you will, will uh, be aware of Bebot, I would imagine, the kind of floor robot. For anyone that isn't aware of Bluebot, it's the same concept, but it's um, connected via Wi-Fi or Bluetooth to a tablet. So you can control the robot using a tablet as well as the kind of floor functions. It doesn't have to just be programming. So she's been exploring Bluebot. After a few videos of her testing out the functions, we receive a video from the mother and her, uh, of her imitating uh, the actions of the robot. The video is 20 seconds long and shows Ellie walking around the robot mimicking actions. She is standing next to Bluebot and looking at him. But her actions don't represent Bluebot's movements. He is uh, on wheels, he looks like a mouse, but she's acting like a humanoid robot. Um, so she's walking around making jotted movements, slowly moving her limbs around. She represents the typical image of a, of, of a robot. She says, this is what a robot does. I am a robot. What do you do? As uh, she says this, her eyes look in all directions, almost crossing over. She continues, I love you. And she walks over to her mum and gives her a kiss who's holding the camera. Her mum cautions, oh, watch, don't stand on him. Um, she appears not to notice her mum's comment, but rather continues with her robot arms, walking around the room, I'm going away now, and she leaves the room. For me, what was really interesting about this concept was, one, that she was creating this imaginary situation in her mind to understand what it means to be a robot. And we all know that that's what play is about. It's about understanding what it feels like to be in an imaginary situation. So she's able to understand 
you know, what it feels like to be a robot. But she also does it in a very unique way. She doesn't copy the robot that she sees in front of her. She represents the stereotypical understanding of this kind of human bodied robot. And she seems to kind of um, take on that shape instead. The other really interesting thing that comes from this um, is this idea that the parent in this situation said, "What? be careful, don't stand on him. And this was a, a kind of trend that we saw in practice as well. When the nursery practitioners were introducing the resources to the children, um, what was really interesting was that they, they said that they introduced him as a pet or they introduced them as a pet. We had a various different resources and most of them were sort of learning robots and either they looked like humans or they looked like little creatures of some kind. Um, and the practitioners introduced them as pets as a means to ensure that the children were safe and careful, careful and gentle with these resources. So that was really interesting because you've got this whole dynamic about how resources become these comforting friend like um, creatures in the same way that perhaps teddy bears might be considered you know, comforting. We've got some data that was really interesting that one of the boys who took home one of the learning robots, which was quite an advanced robot, it had face recognition, it could say your name, it could play games with you. He took it home for a little bit and when he had to send it back to the class, um, the, we had a video from his mum of him touching the iPad, trying to load up this robot and his mum said, are you missing Cosmo? And he said, yes. I love him. He was my friend. I really miss him. So it was really interesting to see how those emotional responses were coming through and how all of that is shaping uh, children's creativity and how they play with resources. So what has come out from this project is that um, really children's experiences are driven by the context and by how we frame um, play and how they frame play for themselves. So when we were thinking about creativity, what was interesting to see was that different contexts had different experiences and therefore children had different experiences with technologies, depending upon the philosophy for the center, um, the agenda, the government agenda that was in place within each individual country, for example. And this all had an impact on how children engaged with resources. So, for example, in the Scottish context, obviously, we are well aware of the need um, to, for raising the attainment, uh, reducing the attainment gap. So that has a real um, impact on priorities. You know, there, there is this um, sort of indirect hierarchy that um, develops as we focus on perhaps numeracy and literacy. Um, and so for the Scottish context, that was really in the forefront of their minds. They were interested in how they can use technologies to support numeracy and literacy. Um, and so the resources were used in quite traditional ways. They picked resources that were geared at those kinds of activities. Quite often they were sort of table-based or desk-based and they were able to justify that to the parents because that was often an issue. How do we justify technology in practice um, to our parents? And by picking resources that were targeted at numeracy and literacy, it gave them that ammunition to say, this is a good thing to use in practice. So that was one element, one way that you might present or might use resources. Um, in the Norwegian context, obviously the, the um, philosophy is very child-led and they allowed the children to create their own scenarios of what they might do with the resources. They had children, they had um, Dash and Dot, which are uh, sort of robots that move very quickly around the space. So they had children who had decided themselves to create human tunnels that the robots could move through their legs and they could chase the resources. And again, it came down to the philosophy of the context. This example here is from the Australian context, and they are very much focused on STEM in this particular centre. They are a STEM based centre. And we got some really fascinating videos of how children were using uh, robotics toys or robot or sort of floor robots and things like that with traditional, integrated with traditional resources. So there was lots of videos of big Frobelian style kind of blocks where the children were building homes for their um, robots. They were driving the, the robots in, controlling the robots to get them in and out of the houses. The practitioners would ask, you know, what do they do when they're in their house? And they'd say, oh, we make them dance. Um, and then they'd control the, the coding on the iPad to make the, the robot do some dance moves. Um, this was the kind of penultimate, uh, the, the um, ultimate uh, fin uh, finale, I suppose, for the project. And they built this robot city. 
um, where they used various different resources and, and uh, different kind of medium to create a city for the, the robots. They have lots of different robo robots dashed about the, um, the actual space. Um, and you can see that there's elements of different focuses in terms of STEM. So they've got these coding cards and they had um, moments where they used woodworking tools to build their own robots as well that they could put into the robot city. And they invited all the parents in and all the parents stood around the space. Children had multiple iPads to control multiple um, robots who could then talk to each other as part of their robot city. So it was really interesting for us to see how actually um, the understanding or the, or the philosophy or the ethos for that particular context really had an impact on children's experiences and how they played. And it was really come, it came down to the, the confidence of the staff and the imagination, you know, that, that willingness to say, well, what can we do that's different? How can we take a resource and not just do what it says on the box? How can we integrate it into our philosophy about early childhood and what is good early childhood philosophy? And that's where we want to, to, to kind of take this work. So we're now looking at um, multimodal life worlds is what we're calling it. And we're gonna try and get a project off the ground to think about how we can integrate technologies creatively into more traditional early childhood pedagogies and what we've called pedagogies for multimodal play and inquiries for uh, an exploration for learning. So it's this idea that technology should never be a disjointed activity or not, never. There are times when that is helpful, but for the most case, we shouldn't expect to see technology as a disjointed activity, a tech, a, you know, a computer corner in the side of the room that is not related to anything else that children are doing in practice. What we want to see is practitioners taking that, their pedagogy, the things that they know are high quality teaching experiences and learning experiences for children and saying, well, how can we take multi multimodal devices and artifacts and integrate that more fully into our play and into children's experiences so that resources become part of the life worlds of children rather than a separate um, activity that they feel that is ticking a box for some sort of curriculum planning or something like that. So that's me. I forgot to tick the uh, button on my timer, so I have no idea whether I stuck to time, but that's, that's what I've got so far. But if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And indeed, if anyone wants to follow up with me afterwards, and feel free to do so. Thank you very much, Lorna. And actually, you're well ahead of time. Oh, good. <laughs> yes. I was very worried that my uh, introduction might have robbed you of some time, but you've only taken about 20 minutes. So well done. That's good. I said I did say maybe I might talk more quickly when I <laughs> when I'm nervous. So well, there we go. That was true. That was very fast. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Every time I did the same. Everyone, I think we agreed with our speakers that they would take questions afterwards um, when both have presented. But if anybody's got um, a burning question right now, I'm sure Lorna could take it because we're, we're fine for time. Um, you've got a, a lovely comment there from Claudette that the first observation was lovely. I think it's really nice to see children making connections to real life scenarios through the use of technologies. Um, so people are absolutely taking in what you shared and I'm sure there will be questions. I know I've got one hanging there about how, how um, you typified Scot Scottish pedagogy and I'd love to talk a bit more about that but okay. at the moment it's not my turn, I'm just going to be marker. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much Lorna and I'm sure everybody will agree with me what a lovely presentation and really drew us in. And uh, we look forward to speaking with you. Um, you. You've got some hand claps coming up in the emojis. Um, and we'll look forward to speaking with you uh, once uh, Liz Cole has um, presented as well. No so thank you so much. And if you wouldn't mind muting just now, we'll see if we can get Liz to come up. Are you ready there, Liz? Yes, I'm here, all present and correct. Oh, super. <laughs> this, this is just wonderful if this all streamlines. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. And I do hope, everybody, that you're managing to hear okay. I think those of you that had difficulties have maybe resolved them by uh, just sticking in there and hanging on. Um, but 
as we said already, both presentations will be available in due course through CIRA YouTube channel. And the link for that will become available, not at once, I think it's usually about 10 days before it appears, um, but it will become available um, on, on the CIRA um, website um, and probably connected to our network through that. So now to turn to Liz and to welcome you very much. Thank and, you. Um, to, uh, I think people are always very brave when they come on and do these things. And particularly, I think when you're still in progress with your work, I think it's, it's great. It's a lovely opportunity all round. So uh, without further ado, you're going to share with us about making di digital innovation connections through no tech and low tech play. Big welcome. Thank you. And Lorna, that was just totally inspired by your work. Um, thank you. Just great to be part of this this evening. So, okay, my name is Elizabeth Cole and I'm a PhD student at the University of Glasgow and I'm positioned within the Centre for Computer Science Education. My research focuses on low-tech and no-tech approaches to digital, techno uh, digital innovation. So my opening phrase is, our children will live in a vast emerald city and their Wizard of Oz will be Google. Digital technologies are everywhere with young children at an influential age and stage of development forming attitudes about their use and value in society. It is likely that children interact with digital toys, experience smart technology controlling environments and observe handheld devices being used by their parents and carers. Children themselves are great users of technologies and now expected to develop an understanding of how they work. What are the implications of this for child initiated learning in early years settings and primary schools? This presentation shares some of the justifications for the shift from users to creators of technology in formal education settings for our youngest learners. It looks at one view of how low tech and no tech play at the early years can underpin successful digital innovation and creativity. Play based learning improves the health of young children under the age of eight. It is essential for a child's physical, social, emotional well-being and cognitive development. Screen time and digital devices, on the other hand, remain a contentious issue at this critical period of rapid brain development. With this in mind, and the high failure rates of existing computer science courses at universities, the increase of computing education curriculum at an early stage of formal education calls for a focus on evidence-informed pedagogy. This can be developed through play, maximising the use of outdoors and minimising health risks at a critical stage of a young child's brain development. This evening, I aim to focus on digital innovation, underpinned by the subject computing science at the early years. The arguments for and against computing science will be discussed and emerging issues supported by empirical evidence in early year settings and primary schools. The next section moves into exploratory work and aligns Scotland's three-step approach to computing science with how listening and talking before reading supports effective writing. It proposes a developmental framework for the child at the centre leading their own learning and concludes with the Scottish frameworks that we work within. <clears throat> Most of the exemplification is taken from a publication written by university and teacher computing science education experts. And now is a time for more early years contributions. And the link will be made available at the end of this talk. 2014 brought an industry and political global shift in expectations for children to be more than digital consumers. As a digital innovator, children will master how digital technologies will work and find new ways to solve problems using computation. At this time globally, many countries were rushing to introduce 
uh, CS in their curriculum. <clears throat> In order to develop the thought processes involved in formulating problems and their solutions so that the solutions are represented in a form that can be effectively carried out by an information processing agent. And that's from Wing in 2007. So some of the justifications that we hear are the economic benefits and filling the pipeline for digital industries that digital technologies are everywhere in a child's life and tacking, tapping into children's inherent curiosity in the world around them, enabling them to grow up mastering the technology as creators and inventors. The rapid brain development of young children enables them to learn a new language and aspects of learning programming reflects that skill. With the tech giants dominating the world, children need to understand their own cultures and identify and solve problems that are relevant to them. There is a view that solving problems like a computer science is beneficial irrespective of a career choice. Problem solving has been with us. Solving 21st century problems can now include computation solutions. We know that some problems are easy to solve, some are hard to solve, some problems which weren't solvable before are solvable now, and some problems cannot be solved yet. This leads to the main research focus, focus area of the presentation this evening and an analysis of emerging practice. Computing science includes how computers and computational systems are designed, programmed and work. There is more to computer science than programming. It involves solving problems and advancing knowledge and includes a distinct way of thinking. Programming is similar to practical work in other subjects. It can provide motivation and not surprisingly, a context to bring ideas to life. But it's much more than coding a term frequently we hear used. There is more to a story than typing the words on a paper. There is creating the plot, the character, typing in a first draft, editing and rewrites. Putting the words on paper in relation to writing is a similar relationship of coding to programming. With the introduction of solving problems like a computer scientist in curriculums, as mentioned before, there's a rush for children to program without experiencing two critical stages that come before. Programming is appearing in early year settings and the early stages of primary through, for example, Bbots, Scratch Junior or Scratch. It is well known that problems with programming are presented at all levels of education especially problematic for beginners due to the abstract content of the programming language. These three studies illustrate the challenges. So study two. B-bots are programmable floor ro robots. Children enter instructions to move the robot forward, backwards, turn right or turn left. When they press the go button, the robot moves as instructed. A small exploratory study of 50 Australian children aged three to five investigates young children's interactions with the programmable toys. Findings showed that the most undertook random button pressing and struggled to understand left or right. They interacted with the devices in a symbolic way similar to other general toys that they played with, with and overall the majority became bored. Looking now at um, area three on the screen, Scratch Junior and Scratch are examples of pure visual programming languages. They represent the graphic environment to play games. Children drag and fit visual components or blocks. Section one shows the tiles from Scratch Junior and a study of 80 children aged seven showed children's reading or interpretation of the symbols needed scaffolding. For example, one child thought the red uh, tile was a racing track. And moving now to another study, 
Salak et al. in 2019 undertook a, stud, a study on 296 children in the United States of America. And this study really shows insight into the relationship between reading scores and deciphering individual blocks, as shown in section three. Perhaps the expectation of children making meaning of this, these symbols is too high. So Salak's work is linked to Karsten Schultz's 2008 block model. The block model can be used for planning and analysing teaching in the area of introductory programming and teaching algorithm. It outlines the basic and essential features of how to learn programming. It looks at program reading before writing as an important stepping stone. The block model is defined as a table with three dimensions and four levels. Blocks are movable and not all need to be taken into account. Comprehension has to start with reading the program text. Word by word, new information is constructed and added in the internal model of the reader. From individual words, which you'll see are circled as atoms, to blocks, to relations, between blocks to recognising the overall structure of the programme or the script. Which types of information is extracted and how the process of abstraction and inferences develops depends on the already constructed mental model. The model draws on psychological research about text comprehension and research on programme comprehension in computer science. This model was first introduced in higher education institutes and then secondary. And my work considers how does it apply in the early years context? Looking again now at the blocks placed together, it does seem feasible that a child may or may not make sense of an individual block, but there is complexity when the blocks are put together. Now moving into the exploratory work of my research, which builds on the Higher Education Institute, Computing Science Discipline and Early Literacy. On the left of the screen is the three stages for writing or creating a story taken from top to right. It is unlikely that a child would be asked to write a story before being stage one, immersed in vocabulary, stage two, exposed to a range of genre through reading, and finally, then they create their own story. The Scottish computer science curriculum is structured in a similar way. Children understand the world through computational thinking, step two. They experience the computa computating language and technologies through reading, sometimes modifying scripts. And then step three, they begin to write them or create their own scripts or sets of instructions. It follows Schultz block model of reading before writing and in the early years my exploratory work is showing that high quality vocabulary can be developed through child-led and adult supported uninterrupted play. The key message is that learning CS or computing science concepts through the Scottish computing science curriculum is structured in three developmental stages. Similarly to listening and talking before reading and reading before writing. It is expected that learners will be able to understand more complicated concepts in the first organiser than they are able to read or write. This table, again from my own work and an exploratory stage, highlights the structure and shows how low-tech and no-tech learning opportunities are of equal importance taking the lead from the child's interest. The third column with technological toys is self-explanatory. Lorna's example earlier from the Australian research is a rich example that reflects a high quality vocabulary in a no text context. And I've extracted a, a list of, uh, sorry, the following list exemplifies and is not exhaustive of some of the key vocabulary that will support children to make meaning of individual computer technology uh, programming symbols or blocks. And you'll recognise them. Follow a straight line. Turn around. What difference does a rough surface make? Sequence. Patterns. Repetition. Repeat. 
And if I say the word run to you, what model uh, conjures up in your head? It has at least two meanings that I can think of. Select, directional language, positional language, logical reasons. And I'd like to point to one of the photographs at the top of the screen. In fact, two were taken from um, a, a Globe blog of Curtin of Largo School. And there's an aspect or a computing science concept about if statements and if conditions. And these two examples illustrate just by simply manoeuvring some of the toys or some of those uh, pencils, a child could be asked, what happens if this moves? What happens next? And if I do this, what will happen next? The list is endless. And once you start thinking about it, you can explore many opportunities in a range of play contexts. There are, of course, limitations with the scope of this work. It looks at the Scottish curriculum three-step approach with children building the scripts after they have the skills and experiences to read, recognise and describe what the programming symbols mean individually and in a sequence. Vocabulary building to improve surface text understanding for young children as defined by Schultz block model and the listening and talking then reading and understanding before creating approach to the Scottish curriculum. However, my main research focus is much broader and the broader skills of solving problems using computation. But this evening's presentation reflects emerging experiences for Scottish children that we are observing in the early years of formal education. My other interest, which does include block play, it does include work play, and it's worth mentioning a study undertaken in 2017 with 1,400 participants. And they were asked, if you could draw, draw your favourite toy as a child, what would it be? And I'll pose a question. Do you think confident users of technologies would draw a space hopper as their favourite toy as a child? No, not surprisingly. With our knowledge and block play, this diagram shows the response from those confident in the use of technologies, which includes programmers. A lot of them responded that they, they enjoyed playing with construction toys with and without moving point parts, which takes us to our block play. And why is this? There is a relationship between block play and STEM and Edinburgh University's Fribble in Early Childhood Practice Associate Tutor and City of Edinburgh Head Teacher Katrina Gill describes the significance of block play in children's early learning and development. She provides clarity on its relationship with abstract thinking, logical thinking and symbolic thinking. She describes the mental pictures of what children see and how they learn about pattern order, relationships and properties of blocks in particular spatial skills. Concurrently, in the computing science landscape at higher education inst institutes, there is presently a healthy interest in the spatial skills and programming, in particular the relationship of rotations in block play and mental models that programmers have. However, block play in the early years and the discipline of computing science specifically is a whole presentation in itself and we're almost coming to the end of my time slot. And although the exploratory stage, I am keen to bring the two disciplines together and work with any early years and computing science colleagues to understand more about this phenomenon. To conclude, the aims for this session, I hope I've covered them, but the work focuses on the representations that children will experience for computer technology to work and providing one approach that may scaffold children in their learning process by focusing on developing their vocabulary. And finally, before I finish, I have to acknowledge the inspiration for my work in this presentation is my early years colleagues at Education Scotland and importantly, realising the ambition. In addition, how good is our school, how good is our early learning and childcare setting, um, our um, Education Scotland's Curriculum for Excellence Technologies, experiences and outcomes and benchmarks all sit well within giving our children in Scotland 
a clearer developmental pathway to understand computing science. And if you enjoyed the ideas attached or that I've presented today, the Teach Computing Science document is freely available for, every, for everybody and there's more, lots more exemplification within there that you can have and that's attached to the presentation. Please contact me by Twitter or email if any of the exploratory work is of interest to you and you would like to work with me to take it forward. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> Uh, what a presentation between the, the two presenters. This is just fabulous because we've got a sort of, um, uh, for me as, as a listener, real techie approach from you, Liz, which bridges it absolutely into what Lorna was saying as well about creative play. And um, as a very old hand from way back, I remember my first head teacher saying, every self-respecting school and nursery should have a good set of blocks. And that's going back a long time. And it's been a joy to me to see how much focus is coming back again through the, the contemporary Frebel movement on the use of blocks with young children, because I think we for too long have underestimated that kind of experience and what it leads on to. So interesting that you quoted Katrina Gill's work as well. And of course, Tina Bruce's work is foundational in that. So thank you so very much from me. And I'm sure I'm echoing um, thanks from everybody else who's with us today. So I'm going to hand over um, to uh, Elizabeth Black, who has been looking at the chat, but we'll be looking everyone, I think, for questions. So you can either wave your hand, but it will be more reliable. Oh, I love the picture. <laughs> um, it'll be more reliable to say in the chat if there's something you would like to ask. So over to you, Elizabeth, if you're there. I am here. Yes, I am here. I was, um, I'll try put, there we go. Here I am. Uh, well, uh, so far we've got your questions, Ellen Wendy. So um, if you, would you like to get the ball rolling? Um, has anybody got a question? Would you like to um, say hello? Uh, we've got a new message down at the bottom. Let's see. Uh, Shad. Okay, we'll start with Shad and we'll keep Ellen Wendy in reserve for, for later. So Shad, um, Shad, do you want to pop your mic on and, and tell us, ask your question yourself? No, <laughs> okay, fine. I'll read it out then. <laughs> so Shad's saying, um, he's got a bit of an academic question. It's uh, for Lorna mainly. Is there a concern that digital toys might limit children's curiosity and imagination as a consequence of their algorithmically generated scripts? Um, hi, I, I, I don't think, I think there is a concern, um, whether it's justified concern, I think is very different. Um, a lot of the work, Jackie, Jackie Marsh's work, for example, talks about the real potential of creativity um, from digital resources. And I, and I always, um, maybe it's a cop out, I don't know, but I always come back to this idea that um, it's how we frame the resources, it's what we do with them. Um, the technology doesn't do the teaching for us and it never should. Um, it's a, a, another mode and another resource that we can draw on. Um, so I don't, I don't think that is uh, an absolute concern. I think there are some people who are concerned by it and I think uh, tabloid press and perhaps parents have that concern because of what they read in the tabloids. Um, but the research certainly is suggesting that there is huge potential for technologies for things like creativity as well, um, and, and even more so with the um, increased um, user friendliness of devices and toys that are um, malleable and, and, and concrete. You know, it's not just always screen based now. Um, so I, I think uh, it's about balance, but, but not necessarily a worry so much. Thanks. I, I've got a question following on from that actually. Because one of the things that comes up, um, and I know there's been a lot of focus on it, a lot of work around numeracy, but um, a few years back, I was looking at numeracy for my master's and that was coming up as, as something where there was a lot of lack of confidence from practitioners in terms of um, being able to 
to identify learning and to do that scaffolding and to, to kind of maximize the potential of learning experiences. So do you think that, that as you were saying, you know, if the role of the adult is kind of crucial in terms of extending the possibilities for these, the, for any kind of technological, technology based toy, um, that that's something we're gonna need to see more support for practice to develop that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, absolutely. I think, um, you know, going far back in terms of technology literature, you know, Christine Stevens and, and Lydia Plyman would have always said that, um, you know, it's about scaffolding their work on guided interaction, for example. Um, so I think that the role of the adult can never be underestimated. And, the, and that's why I said the technology doesn't do the teaching for us. It doesn't do, do the pedagogy for us. We still have to do the decision making. Um, what, what evidence we do have from um, some of our nurseries is how um, the technology can create opportunities for engagement with subjects like numeracy that perhaps weren't there before. So in the Scottish context, um, I, I said earlier that they, they chose specific technologies for particular reasons and one of them was numeracy and they said that they, they were quite um, fascinated by the way that uh, the resources would engage boys particularly in numeracy activities that they wouldn't normally be interested in doing in more um, traditional ways um, and that they so we've, and it's published in one of one of our um, chapters somewhere I can find it for you uh, but it, they said that it was actually really interesting because the, the children didn't know they were doing numeracy they didn't see it as a stigma in the same way that they might have seen um, with other types of uh, activities so they were really um, encouraging about the opportunities but I but I'm not I'm not saying we should do te technology with everything I don't believe that I think there is a space for it but I don't believe it should overshadow and it's about that, that decision making have we lost Liz <laughs> no I'm still here oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just listening no, no, the other Liz that was, she was doing the questions. You're on mute, Taylor and Wendy. I'll jump in, I was saying, but that's not much use if I'm on mute. Thank you, Lorna. Um, the, very interestingly, because you raised the question of, of activating boys' interest, Lorna, and, and it, it, Liz, please join in with this. Um, there is a question from Angela about uh, wanting to know from both speakers if their research has found if there's any differentiation um, in the gender of children who are accessing digital toys. Is the interest from in them more from boys or from girls or both? So maybe Elizabeth, you would like to yeah okay it, and then yeah. hand over to Lorna. Yeah, so just to distinguish, my work's looking at digital innovation. So that's a bit about the children actually controlling the technology and creating the solutions. It's not that they're users where they're using apps and um, phones. You know, it's quite a different um, category. But what we did find was uh, one of the studies that undertook uh, the children to work in trios. And where there was a boy in the trio, the boy grabbed the mouse and took control of the mouse. And the girls quite happily sat down and, and kind of told them what to do, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, then we did, uh, we did a logistic re regression and we looked at the successes of the children. And without exception, I think I've worked with 300 children, the boys actually, in typical methods, and this is the early stages of primary, achieve more. Um, within the typical approaches to programming and I think there's a lot to do with that around some of the environments because um, we asked the children at the end of the six-week study um, okay some of you have done really well or oh, we didn't say that um, we said okay um, who would like to continue doing this and 80% of the boys wanted to continue and something like 40% of the girls wanted to continue but the environment they were using was a 3D animation game and I just don't think the girls were interested in it. So they were very capable, they were achieving success, but it really didn't motivate them to learn. Um, so yeah, that's two examples. I could give you a lot more, but I'll let Lorna speak. Thank you very much. I think it's really interesting too that there's quite a lot in psychology about uh, boys' preference for object-related play 
and girls' preference for social play. If we're going to, uh, it's a bit of stereotyping in a sense, but the literature is there on both of those. Um, that and. Uh, there was a wonderful example from Reggio Emilia about uh, children uh, thinking about how their city worked and the girls were absolutely focused on all the social relationships and where their auntie lived and the boys were absolutely focused on the infrastructure and whether the sewerage worked and the transport worked. So uh, it's just one example of children's uh, creative thinking really about a city infrastructure. It kind of sits with what you're both talking about. So Lorna, could we turn the question to you? Uh, yeah, I mean, we didn't do any particular, any specific gender analysis, I suppose. We didn't set out to explore gender um, specifically. Um, but I mean, there were elements, you know, the, the, the staff, like I said, the staff made comments about boys being more engaged with certain curricular areas. Um, there was uh, a, a discussion that every time the technology came out, the same boys came and they would stay for the whole session, whereas girls would maybe float in a bit more and float out again, but nothing striking. But I think that probably comes back to the fact that we have a very broad definition of what we're looking at with technology. So um, there's lots of physical hands-on resources with the robotics toys. Um, there's lots of opportunity for that role play with the you know with the the kind of cultural artifacts discussion so perhaps it's just because we have a broader um interpretation which then lends itself to more ways of playing perhaps than than um strictly what's in the you know with an online virtual space uh, but no not not specifically nothing struck us that that was really interesting that it was definitely boys that did this and definitely girls that did, that did that yeah yeah, that, that's interesting. Thank you very much. And I think that bears out a lot in terms of ensuring there's equity in the offer. So Marie had a question, and then I'm going to hand back to Elizabeth Black, who's back, um, who, and Marie's saying, fantastic speakers, both of you, thank you. Um, she says, I wonder, do either of you have any view on digital equity issues with access to technology, perhaps more from a family learning perspective than from ELC or early primary? Who'd like to try that one? Can I, oh sorry, on you go, Lorna. No, on you go, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> Talking about each over if you'd spoken. Um, so just one thing around equity, we were interested in uh, social and economic uh, deprivation and how that affected the language development of the children. And it's been fascinating because actually there was no difference. So the social economic status of the child, and then we looked at their progress in, and we did a logistic regression and again, nothing and, and we, we sat and talked about that long and hard and we thought we wondered if it's because um, because te digital technologies are relatively new in terms of that programming environment that everybody's maybe pretty equal in terms of the language of some of the the, the vocabulary they need to know to access the um, the programming but no we're, we're a bit baffled with that one and perhaps over time that might change as more young children are exposed to digital technologies and they have more access because of the family backgrounds that they're living in. Um, I mean our, our work was conducted in, in a sort of it, it, we, don't, we don't pretend that it's um, diverse I suppose we, we went with um, partners that, that we're used to working with. We also provided resources, so that kind of alleviated some of that that question about whether they had resources. What we did find that was quite interesting, because I think there's often a discussion about if there's a disadvantage and people don't have access to technology. Um, but in our some of our more affluent um, partners uh, and and affluent areas, some of the the, the parents actually made the decision to limit technology um, because of the perception of what technology entails and whether the children should be using it. And there's still this ongoing debate about whether parents and practitioners feel comfortable in justifying the resource. So there will be some situations where actually a very affluent family might very explicitly say, we have one family iPad and, um, you know, I think in this particular family, the husband worked offshore and he took the iPad with him when they went off, when he went offshore. And it wasn't for not being able to um, invest in more. It was a conscious decision that we are not a technology um, 
abundant household and we make that choice quite, quite purposeful. We had another um, a, a family member and they were very explicit that, you know, if you go out to a restaurant, they take colouring pencils and, and crayons and things and there was no way that um, iPads were getting anywhere near the dinner table and it was a conscious choice. Um, so I think that there will be the challenges with access, but I think at the other end of the spectrum, people are also making decisions about how much access they want their children to have, even if the resources are readily available. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting perspective as well. The idea, you know, is especially at the moment, such a focus on digital poverty, that uh, that idea of I don't know what you'd call that, but you know, by choice, to <laughs> digital anorexia, um, you know, but, you know, choosing not to not to engage um, is is another kind of aspect to that. Claudette, has that kind of covered your question? You said you were interested in the same issue. Is there anything you wanted to add to that question, or do you feel that you've had a, a good answer? No, but that covers it. It does. Um, I was just quite interested to see about you know, is there a gap within the skills and experiences that's provided from the nursery um, with children who we know have access to it and don't? But as you say. It's, it's come, can it come across as not? So it was quite interesting to hear that. So yeah, that's covered that. Thank you. Great. Um, and moving down the, the chat then, I see that there was a, a post from Robert who is talking about the benefits for technology and bilingual learners. So that's something that you found a, as an experience, uh, in your experience, that that's been very helpful. Um, do you want to elaborate on that, Robert? or? I just want to say that um, working with bilingual families, we would use things like uh, digital photographs. I mean, the children were starting and new to English, and we'd just get mum or dad or grand to record an essay saying, it's okay, I'll be there in five minutes, and the comfort that that brought the children. And the other kind of big thing that was really important for us was using things like talking pens. So these were, we would buy bilingual books, and we could download the audio for the whole languages that the children and families were using. And then we would use this kind of low-tech and high-tech approach where we'd send a story sack home that had the different characters, wooden characters and different parts to the story. It would include the bilingual book and a talking pain, which meant that the families could engage with the story through their home languages. But also we found that sometimes the mums and dads, the grandparents, were using it for them to learn English as well. They could hear the story in English. So that kind of technology was being used to support English, but was also important for us to support the home language. So it was hugely beneficial, especially in, in an environment where a lot of the, the earliest practitioners, teachers, didn't know the languages of the families. So that was a big bridge. So we found it really, really useful. Yeah, that sounds like a really nice example of the no tech, uh, no tech meeting the technology that the the presenters were talk, kind of describing earlier, especially Elizabeth, that was one of your kind of key things, wasn't it? But also I think Lorna, you were talking about that kind of mixture with the Australian example, weren't you, between the two, how it can enhance it? Yeah, I mean, we don't have bilingual data, but um, it, it does speak to me in terms of non-verbal or pre-verbal children that, that we've worked with and that idea that it gives you a mode for expression um, that perhaps they didn't have before. So we did some work with children and we looked at uh, Book Creator. Um, and so children were able to create their own narrative with Book Creator because it has the option to include pictures and drawing and audio and all those kind of elements. And we mixed that with malleable tactile resources as well, like, you know, sculpting and, and um, junk modeling and all these kind of things that they could then capture in their Book Creator. Um, so I think there's opportunities for these resources, not just for, for second language learning or, or um, those kind of things, but for understanding children's perspectives, they give, it gives you a sort of new, um, new way of capturing their perspective, perhaps, that we didn't have before. Yeah, thank you. Um, Elizabeth, you want to add anything? Um, no, my only uh, point on... Uh, bilingualism is our view is or our hypothesis we've got nothing really to prove on it in terms of very young children at the moment but um, in terms of children acquiring an additional language and how they, when they're immersed in it at a very young stage they seem to pick it up um, really quite readily 
And as a school of thought, that's why it's good to sh introduce them to programming languages when they're young, because the, the theory is that will be the same. I have my doubts with it because, you know, we, we use natural language when we're just we're talking at the moment and it's a very precise language that a computer program runs on and so you've got another additional challenge for a child to move from the natural language into the precise knowledge but as I say it's fascinating and one of the studies we had I think about 60% of the children in the class um, English was an additional language and it certainly didn't you know there was no barriers to them achieving as well as everybody else in the class so that was quite positive but that's maybe my postdoc if I ever get finished this one <laughs> it's always good to have a next step um now did you pick up on Marion's comment about uh, realizing the ambition earlier on Alan Wendy um I think Marion you'd commented how nice it was to see the kind of connections um with that coming through yeah, I didn't pick up on it. Um, I can't see. Oh, there's Marion. Marion, would you like to comment any more about that? Well, only to say that it wasn't so much a question as a, a, a very welcome thing to be picking up on from both presentations. Uh, you were just picking up on the, the fact that uh, play is, is very much a kind of cultural thing, but it's also creative. And I think using technologies uh, it is, is certainly welcome. So, so thank you both. Thanks, Thanks Marion. I, sorry, just to jump in, but I do have that document has completely inspired me in, in my work. And, you know, it made me really revisit some of the things we expect very young children to do or, or that I've observed and especially around these b boys and um, you know and, and I just thought that study was great where the children actually didn't bother using them as robots they just used them as <laughs> cars and things and, um, and then they got broken and there's a lovely um, thing on the glow blog I think it was a uh, bathgate nursery where they've taken all the b bots to bits and, and it's just fantastic the children look so enthralled in that piece of learning and then you think that by somebody making a child actually program it when they just wanted to take it to bits and go inside and see what how why it was working so yeah well done Mary. I'm just think that realizing ambition is is just a way forward and, that, and we really in the computing science center want to capture that thinking so that the more we understand about computing science in the early years there's very little being done about it that we really get it right for the children uh, can I just pick up on that? Because I think it's really interesting. Because you're saying it's it's fantastic to see the children taking the things apart, but I think yeah, we also have to recognise the um, courage for practitioners to be able to for you know follow through with that idea of of how how you might play and how you might explore. I mean, there's some data from a, a long time ago about how children used to take you know big desktop computers apart to see the wiring inside. But I think it, it takes a lot of um, courage and imagination from a practitioner to be able to follow through with that and not worry about, oh, well, you know, what do we do about um, uh, it, um, the, the cost of it if you're taking these things apart? There's still a learning experience in there that can be justified. And to be able to take that step and say, well, we're going to do something different with it, I think is really important. Yeah, Lauren, I totally agree with you. I, I, had, I hadn't even thought about doing that. Uh, and then I watched the children do it. And then I thought, oh my goodness, do they not cost about £70 each? <laughs> so anyway. Yeah. Yeah, no, as soon as you said that, I was like, I was taken right back to, to being a practitioner and just being like the children running them on the, the ground. And yeah, so nice to feel free to be able to kind of take that perspective. But I'd like to go, I think, Ali, Wendy, you had a question related to realising ambition as, as well and the kind of focus on literacy and numeracy. Was that right? Yeah, actually, there are so many questions. I wanted to ask Lorna something about um, her ecological approach. And well, that's she, right, yeah. She almost answered it when, uh, when I'd made a note for myself. But I also wanted to ask both of you, um, in relation to something that Lorna said, about culture and contexts and the different countries in your study and it just sounded a little bit as if Scotland was typified as being constrained about play because we have this overarching um, literacy numeracy focus and worry about attainment gaps for children and you know it's how that all sits together with realizing the ambition as well which is a very it's it's promoting a play pedagogy and that also sits with what um you've both just been talking about about 
our confidence, and I say our, our practitioner confidence, but all of us involved in early years about what's okay. You know, um, I probably wouldn't be so happy about an expensive bit of equipment being taken apart, but I would be very ready to find other things with children that they could take apart and to perhaps draw some differences between why you would explore and demolish something, but you might not demolish the other thing because I think that's also learning um, and not inhibiting. Yeah, so, and I, I, I don't know the comments on any of that, please. <laughs> I suppose that to me, I think is, it goes back to the idea of creative, creative practice and, and, and imagination and seeing things differently. So I assume that they took that Bebot apart because it had become broken and they didn't choose to, but it still, it still takes a bit of courage and a bit of imagination and a bit of, um, uh, 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 creativity to think, well, what can we do with this? What can we make out of this resource that is a, that is beneficial and child led and, um, you know, really valuable rather than just saying, well, that's broken and put it in the bin. Um, but I, I do think that the, perhaps with technology, we're, maybe we're more constrained. I do think there's some fabulous practice in Scotland. And I think we are well known for, for play and leading the way with play. Um, but I think with technology that becomes more challenging because people perhaps see it as a confined or constrained resource. Um, so sometimes it's about difficulty seeing what the possibilities are with a resource and you just need the inspiration and you need the ideas. Um, you know, and we had some sort of sharing amongst our um, international partners and, and showed them what the other countries were doing. And it wasn't, it wasn't because, um, it was just because they hadn't thought about it. You know, it, it, they just saw it in a different way because they had a different agenda in their mind. And also they were able to justify for the parents. That was the main thing. How can I justify how I can embed this in practice? And numeracy and literacy was an easy tick box to say to parents, if we use this resource, it'll help them with literacy and numeracy because all the parents then go brilliant, do it. So I think maybe perhaps more constrained around technology than some of the other areas. Thank you. Can I make a response to that um, from my side of the house, which is about that, um, you know, that programme, the computer science, the computational problem solving. This, for, for me, in terms of the launch of Realising Ambition, is it's just an opportunity. It's a gift in our hands because the computing science experiences and outcomes are so new we don't have a lot of exemplification and that's why I really am genuinely calling in people to please get in touch I'm writing up my PhD at the moment right now I'm a bit busy just now but maybe in December onwards and I would love to work with people and really get this absolutely right and get some exemplification up there really to support because people are saying how, how do we do this with very young children and already just breaking down the early level into that more focus on the non-tech and using that discreetly, the early years practitioners that I've shown that to and worked with and talked about it, they found that really, really helpful. So the child doesn't have to go and be forced to play with a Bebo and, and program it. They can go outside and play and still develop that rich language that will support them when they actually come to experiencing program at the right time. Yeah, you're both so right and thank you very much. It, it's it, probably so much of that the learning is actually for us as adults and to build our confidence and give us the language to use and know how to respond appropriately to children in a way, whatever they're doing, seeing the opportunity, because it's about, like Lola said, it's about embedding it. And I won't take long, Elizabeth, but just a very quick one about the ecological um, arguments, because, um, you're both really saying that everything influences everything else and it, it shapes understanding. And, and I had a little question at that point in Lorna's presentation about do children influence the environment? But I want to head that up, that it was an early question and that I think you both answered that, that of course, if we have the right mindset, mm. children can influence what's going on and, and they will anyway. Yeah. But it's important that we recognize it and we support that and know how to extend rather than what Lorna was saying about, well, maybe something's broken, so we'll put it away. Hmm. I, I, yeah, if I could pick up on that, because there's a couple of things you picked up on and you said it's about our practitioner confidence. And what was has really struck me in uh, um, the work that we're doing is how this, 
our technologies are so new. Technologies are always evolving. They're always changing. And so that idea of, um, you know, masters and novices or whatever you might, uh, you know, in situated learning theory and community of practice and all those kind of things where you have these masters and novices or experts and, and, and um, those who are still kind of developing their expertise with technologies, they're so new that even the practitioners are not the expert. And what we begin to see is this really interesting community where practitioners and children are learning to use the resource together um, and the, the practitioners are reducing some of the you know they're, they're alleviating some of the um the kind of power dynamics that were once there because the, the children are, are stepping up and telling their parents how to use things and the practitioners are thankful for that and the parents are thankful for for that so that was really interesting i think just to see how that dynamic has shifted that it's it's a community of everyone learning about technology together um was really interesting um and and we had children we had one example of a child who was so confident with the technology after having it at home, he was described by the nursery as quite shy. Um, and actually when he brought the technology back in, he really came out of his shell. He became a leader. He started showing all the practitioners how to use it. He started leading groups of children and how to play with these particular resources. So I think there are opportunities to, to embrace. Um, there are challenges too, but, uh, but, but there are opportunities to, to do that kind of thinking. Thanks. And just to connect, um, Claudette's posted the, the point there as well that you know, were talking about practitioners here and practitioner confidence. And then there's always that next step, isn't there? Like, and when practitioners become confident and they're able to share confidently with parents, and then you can get the parents kind of on side about the benefits as well, um, or, you know, and, and why it's worthwhile without having to necessarily frame it in the, you know, back to, well, it'll help them learn to write, it'll help them learn to read. Sorry, Liz, I cut in there. Elizabeth, did you want to say anything about that other point as well? No, yeah. <laughs> Your hand was back. I thought you weren't ready to hit the buzzer, but, you know. Um, but, um, yeah, and we've got connections here to sustain shared thinking. We've got the idea of co-creating knowledge. You know, it, it's really nice examples of all these kind of um, principles that you want to see throughout practice when you're looking at, at early years as well. And perhaps just another example of where early years practice can lead the way. Uh, with, with, um, <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll show those secondary school people what to do. And we'll definitely can show those uh, higher education people because I think we see, we're see we seeing so many parallels to this in higher education at the moment. I'm not sure how many of our audience here today are currently involved in that, but the, the pivot to online that universities and further further education is going through is kind of underscoring that difference of the power dynamic that shifts when we're all learning together you know um, and yeah parents sharing from their experience of using technology as well Shan's pointing that out that you know it yeah if the the parents are knowledgeable that is another opportunity for for them to bring that in is that have I picked your point up correctly there Shan ah battery <laughs> uh, um, so I think, have we finally exhausted the, the comments and, and the, um, I think we may have done. Ali, Wendy, you've got any more tucked up your sleeve? No, I haven't, but, <laughs> I'm, but I'm sure we haven't exhausted it. I think what um, Lorna and Elizabeth have given us is a real kickstart to thinking again about this. Um, and it, it's been a lovely session. I've, I've really enjoyed it and I'm thinking through some of the evidence I have in my research and thinking um, I, I've always loved the idea of co-creation with children rather than um, Shan gave us with families um, and I like it as a term better than co-construction because it just captures something a little bit more about um, this is an enterprise that, that, sure, it builds on what children already know, but it, to do that creatively is really important. And, and um, it, that kind of suggests the pleasure in finding out. So, I enough agree. from me, and thank you very much. <laughs> I agree. Th and thank you as well, Liz. It's been fascinating to hear about PhD, and, and you sound like you're about to submit very soon so very best of luck and I look forward to seeing the final thing because it will be really really interesting I think it'll be really helpful uh, to see how that can have a practice impact as well so well thank you luck. no 
Thank you very. I need the luck, eh? and it's really no, good. No, you to don't. Meet you. you don't. You don't. You're very com confident in what you have to say. Oh, well, thank Show you. your confidence. So everybody, <laughs> uh, uh, back to me to, in chairing the session and closing it. Uh, I made my personal thanks, but I would like to make thanks on behalf of everybody who joined us and from um, my co. Um, uh, coordinators of the Sierra EYN and all the hard work they put into everything. And watch this space, please, all participants for the next events. They'll be coming your way and Shad will make sure you know when the recording of this session is available. And we're quite excited because this is our first and more or less it seems to have gone well technologically. We probably have a bit to learn about the audio. But many, many thanks to both of you and as I said to uh, all participants giving your time because it's a premium and from colleagues who uh, together we we co-create the CIRA network. So all the thanks coming in and clapping hands and um, go and enjoy your tea. Thank